Uh, the next uh, first item of business is portfolio questions. Question one, Ryan Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what value cycle tourism has to the Scottish economy. Nature, heritage and activities such as cycling are all identified as a key asset in the industry-led Tourism Scotland 2020 strategy. Uh, based on their usage estimates of the National Cycle Network, the March 2017 research uh, by Sustrans Scotland and Scottish Enterprise valued cycle tourism as adding £345 million to the Scottish economy in 2015. On Monday, I visited the Glentress Forest and met with local business people from the world leading mountain biking trails there. Uh, I understand that the two-week Tweedlove Bike Festival over two weeks in May brought 5,000 visitors and a net impact of £594,000 to the Tweed Valley economy. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And with that in mind, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that when new road infrastructure projects are in the design phase, cycle and walking paths should be an integral part uh, of that design? And does she therefore find it regrettable that the A77 Maybell bypass does not include such plans and therefore highlights yet again the southwest of Scotland being excluded from this type of investment and positive tourist outcome? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the South of Scotland donation in particular uh, has a focus particularly on outdoor activities and coastal routes. I'm not aware of a tourist route uh, around the Maybell bypass. Um, and obviously has, has questions relating to tourism. Uh, but I do know that where, for example, rail links, and I've I referred just to the, my experience uh, this week in the Tweed Valley, uh, they've used the, uh, the uh, opportunity to have cycle tracks there, as did the Basket Airgy line using um, the old Solon for, for cycle tracks. Uh, where cycling can be part of road uh, developments, the, 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 that is a matter for Transport Scotland. I understand parts of the A9, for example, have cycling as part of um, the route development that's there. But obviously, I'm sure he can make uh, applications and his case known to Transport Scotland. But from a tourism point of view, uh, he can be assured that I am investing and supporting uh, the work of Visit Scotland uh, on cycling and cycling tourism. Question two, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it last, met, uh, when it last discussed the commissioning of programmes with MG Alaba. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I last met with MG Alba on the 24th of August, although what is commissioned on BBC Alba is a matter for the joint working between MG Alba and the BBC independent of government. Uh, Scottish ministers and government officials do, however, keep regular contact with MG Alba and a range of relevant matters are discussed. I've also recently met and discussed matters relating to BBC Alba with the BBC. Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the £1 million pressure fund which MG Alaba has received in recent years as a top-up to their core funding, which helps MG Alaba commission extra programmes. However, as this funding is not included in MG Alaba's core funding, it not only causes them concern, but concern to the Gaelic independent production sector, which relies heavily on the seasonal commissioning rounds uh, the pressure fund is used for. There are concerns... No, 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 no. Will the, cabinet Question. Secretary, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to raise the issue with the Deputy First Minister and the Finance Secretary with a view to ensuring the £1 million pressure fund is included in MG Alaba's core funding from now on? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm not responsible for the funding of MG Alba. I have responsibility for broadcasting. Uh, I'm sure the member would regret that the UK government did not continue its £1 million uh, pound funding. It's not a pressure fund. Uh, the, the additional funding from the Scottish government was for specific uh, commissioning. I think it is helpful to MG Alba to have had that. Uh, we ha are committed in our manifesto to maintain our uh, funding for investment in MG Alba and will continue to press the BBC to increase funding for the BBC the Alba programming. So I think we've been quite clear in our manifesto on which the member was elected and I'm sure he, like I, will press not only the BBC but the UK to step up to the mark in their funding for MG Alba. Neil Finlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the impact is on the cultural se uh, culture sector of reduced local government budgets. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the overall increase in spending power to support local authority services this year amounted to over £383 million or 3.7% of an increase compared to 2016-17. The 2018-19 budget will continue to treat local government fairly, despite the cuts to the Scottish budget from the UK government. And due to the UK government's austerity regime, we are aware that there are challenges and that we're doing all that we can to protect Scotland's culture and historic environment and to ensure that our diverse and world-class cultural and heritage scenes continue to thrive. Of course, local councils are responsible for their own spending decisions on culture. Neil Finlay. Thoroughly depressing answer from the Cabinet Secretary. Mid Council are being forced to consider 
another 13.5 million of cuts this year, and no doubt it will be the same or more next year. Included in that is the closure of libraries. And across Scotland, uh, sport, music, the arts and culture are in the front line with councils of all political persuasions proposing major cuts. So what is the Cabinet Secretary doing to protect sport, culture and the cultural sector from yet more cuts? And can she tell us what representation she's No, made? Arthur, you've had one question. Sorry, one supplementary. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government have consistently uh, supported our cultural sector. He mentions libraries in particular. We have, and I personally, as the, the responsible minister, have supported investment in libraries. And I'm looking forward to an event in the North East um, to mark that on uh, Friday. Uh, councils are responsible for their own cultural spending. It's not a statutory requirement. And he'll be aware that in West Lothian, and I was very shocked to see this, that the Labour-run uh, administration, their budget estimates for 1718, was uh, the largest out of every single local authority and council in, in, in Scotland. Others are increasing their cultural spend, uh, but perhaps because of the austerity uh, measures that are being uh, impacted on us from the UK government. You could ask his West Lothian Labour Council, uh, which are in administration with the Conservatives, to perhaps address that point. And perhaps the figure of 14% reduction compared to other areas where you you actually see an increase in expenditure. East Ayrshire, for example, a 7% budget estimate increase for 1718 shows in stark contrast the value that local decision makers can have in influencing their cultural impacts. Can I say to members and to the front bench, I want to get everybody in, I want supplementaries in, but questions must be brief and uh, answers as brief as they can possibly be while answering the question. I'll take two supplementaries in this. Brief questions, please. Rona Mackay to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the significant impact a reduction in national lottery income for good causes will have on the organisations which rely on it, such as Creative Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what representations she's making to the UK Government to ensure this impact, the impact of this reduction is mitigated? Cabinet Secretary. I think it will be a concern to all members to, to realise that the uh, a reduction in national lottery income for good causes reduced by 14% uh, between 15, 16, 16, 17, and by a further 4% in the first half of 2017 18. Uh, along with the uh, sports minister, Eileen Campbell, we have written to our counterparts in the UK government to urge them, because of the reduction in that income, some of it from the decision making made by the UK government in relation to the lottery, that they need to take cognizance of that in their forthcoming budget. And in addition to that a letter to Karen Bradley, uh, Derek Mackay, the finance minister, also wrote uh, into the UK Treasury uh, and relayed the concerns uh, of a number of issues, including the reduction in lottery funding for both culture and sports. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We all saw the uh, letter that the Cabinet Secretary wrote to the UK Government on cultural funding, funding through National Lottery. As she described, funding is going down. No, no, no. I want a question, down. please. It's absurd to depict this as a UK Government cut. This is a question. Given, she called, oh, last. Given, the U, given that she called on the UK government to develop a recovery plan to meet the shortfall, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Scottish government has a plan too? And will she today commit no, to immediate one question. publication Thank you. of this plan? Thank you. I, I said it wasn't a cut from the UK government. I specifically said it was a, a reduction in national lottery income. But the decisions that the UK government make in terms of the licensing and indeed the range of lotteries that they uh, uh, make available, it does have, a, have an impact in the choice available and can have an impact in the, the income level. So they do actually have a responsibility. And that is why we think it's incumbent on the UK government to address that. Uh, for our part, over the many years, uh, despite the, the the reductions in UK funding for, for Scotland, we have protected cultural funding because we think that cultural funding is important to the life of this country, but also to its economic impact. Question four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the future of UK U, EU nationals currently working in Scotland post-Brexit. Minister Alison Allen. The Scottish Government has repeatedly urged the UK Government to guarantee the rights of EU citizens and their families living in the UK post-Brexit. 
We want EU citizens in Scotland to feel settled and secure and to continue to make a strong contribution to our country. The Scottish Government has not been substantially engaged in the detail of the negotiations. But last week, the Scottish Government provided the UK Migration Advisory Committee with the latest evidence on the overwhelmingly positive contribution that EU citizens make to Scotland and the vital importance of continued free movement in delivering future population growth and economic growth. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, does the Minister see any prospect of a solution to the fishing industry's uh, problems which has 70% of workers in the North East of Scotland are not UK nationals? Minister. Uh, as the member points out, this is a huge uh, problem for Scotland's onshore processing sector, where EU nationals make up 58% of the workforce in large sea proce seafood processing factories, uh, and uh, in the Grampian area even higher. Uh, as we've made clear, those who choose to live and work in Scotland, whether they're from the EU or elsewhere, uh, are welcome and needed. Uh, and it's for exactly this reason why the UK government must give assurances. Uh, I've been asking for these assurances and for the UK government immediately to remove uh, the unnecessary uncertainty to both businesses uh, and to the workers that the member refers to. Question five, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that there is transparency regarding lobbying when its International Development Fund offers humanitarian aid. Minister. The Scottish Government's £1 million humanitarian emergency fund is activated and distributed either in response to the launch of a disasters emergency committee appeal or on the recommendation of the independent expert HEF panel, which is made up of eight of the leading humanitarian aid organisations in Scotland. Ash Denham. The Minister agree that it was concerning to hear reports last week that the former UK Government International Development Minister Priti Patel held secret discussions about routing aid through the Israeli military. Can I ask the Minister what representations he has made to the UK Government to ensure that their decision making on humanitarian aid allocations is transparent and free from undue political Minister. interference? Well, I hear the, the muttering from some quarters opposite, but I, I struggle to, to, to visualise what would have happened to me if I had gone on a rogue mission to offer to give Scottish aid money to a government uh, in Israel to use through their military in an area of uh, land which is not recognised as their territory by the UK. I think enough has been said about that matter. Suffice to say that I have written to the Foreign Secretary uh, to ask what exactly Priti Patel was thinking of in this instance. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister what the last award of emergency humanitarian aid by the Scottish Government was, and is it arranging to make any other soon? Minister. Well, we have uh, recently um, assisted the Rohingya people uh, uh, and their plight uh, uh, fleeing from uh, uh, real persecution uh, and uh, ending up in camps in Burma, and uh, we continue to uh, receive representations uh, uh, both from the sector and uh, uh, more generally about the best use of the, the fund in the future, but we, we take very seriously our responsibility to disperse that in a, in a fair basis. Question six, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides for community radio stations such as East Coast FM in East Lothian. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, community radio channels received a total of 307 £307,000 from the Scottish Government for running public information adverts between January 2011 and November 2017. Ofcom administers a community radio fund which has been taking applications for 2017-18. Uh, this fund can be accessed by Scottish-based stations like East Coast FM. I met uh, its director, Mr Ian Robertson, uh, last year at the invitation of Mr Gray and I would like to congratulate Mr Robertson on his silver award as Volunteer of the Year at this year's UK Community Radio awards. Ian Gray. Uh, indeed, that's uh, much appreciated and the uh, Minister will be pleased to know that uh, East Coast FM received yet further awards, a Princess Royal Training Award uh, recently at St James's Palace, where they were one of 40 businesses chosen for creating lasting impact by successfully linking their skills development needs to business performance. Uh, that demonstrates, I think, the important role. Question, Mr. Green. That demonstrates the important role Question. beyond simple broadcast media they play. Could they not receive uh, more support than they do from our government? 
Cabinet uh, Secretary. When we last met, <coughs> the, the member raised the situation in Wales. Of course, you'll be aware that the Welsh Government uh, closed its radio fund in 2013-14. Um, I've written to Mr Gray outlining the number of different uh, funding sources that community, community radio can access, uh, and I encourage him to uh, ensure that that communication is uh, communicated to Mr Robertson, as well as my congratulations. Question 7, Bob Doris. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what support it offers communities in Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn constituency to celebrate the area's cultural history. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Creative Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland promote the rich culture and traditions of our communities in many different ways. In 2016, the Maryhill Borough Halls Trust received uh, uh, almost £5,000 from Creative Scotland for the Maryhill Songbook, which is inspired by historic poems in the Trust collection, which relate to Maryhill. Uh, Toonspeak Young People's Theatre also received £30,000 from Creative Scotland for the Mabit, a large-scale contemporary musical theatre production created by young people, helping to build a greater connection for young people in their co uh, communities and Historic Environment Scotland Support Fund can provide grant assistance since a grant assistance of up to £5,000 for one-off heritage-related events. Bob Doris. Uh, can I draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to plans for a Maryhill Museum based at the stunningly restored borough halls in my constituency mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary? Could I extend an invite to the Cabinet Secretary to join me to see for herself, at some, perhaps at some point in the year, the importance of the excellent work being undertaken by Maryhill, Maryhill borough halls? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. I'd be delighted, to, uh, diary permitting, to return to Mary Hill Borough Halls. I was there um, at the official opening when it was uh, reopened after extensive investment. I think it's a great celebration of uh, traditions, history, but uh, engagement also with the local community. Brief supplementary, Annie Wells. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Glasgow is a fabulous culture which has been richly celebrated over the years. Um, what discussions has the Scottish Government had with Glasgow City Council ahead of their upcoming budget to ensure that proper support and funding is given to local communities to encourage tourism? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'll be meeting with Glasgow City Council in the next few weeks. I, only this morning I was in Glasgow. I was hearing about the GI Festival. It's going to be fantastic. I met with uh, Glasgow Life representatives there. Um, I think that the new administration in Glasgow is to be commended for putting centre stage its approach to culture and creativity. And I look forward to, en to engaging with Glasgow City Council as they move forward to a very exciting year with the anniversary of a year of Celtic Connections and also the European Championships, which again will be a great opportunity to showcase and celebrate the great traditions of Glasgow, the great city. Question 8, John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Visit Scotland regarding tourism in Ayrshire. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government Programme for Government uh, commits us to promoting the south of Scotland and Ayrshire as a tourism destination for coastal and forest tourism activities. I met Malcolm Roughhead, the CEO, to visit Scotland only last week, and part of our discussion was about progress and how Visit Scotland is taking forward that commitment. In particular, there is to be a two-week-long digital skills push to increase the number of Ayrshire tourist business, businesses using digital channels. John Scott. Um, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. And the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Visit Scotland's proposal recently announced will mean that there will not be a tourist hub on mainland Ayrshire and that information about Ayrshire is to be provided in future from either the hub in Dumfries or Glasgow. As I think it's unreasonable that Ayrshire should be neglected in this way, will the Cabinet Secretary join with me in making representation to Visit Scotland that a presence is retained in air, please? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly these are matters that are operational matters for Visit Scotland, but he will be aware that there has been a 58% drop in visitor numbers to the Visit Scotland Eye Centres and a 62% drop in particular in air. The footfall in air dropped from 50,000 in 2006-07 to uh, 19,000. Uh, he's wrong to say that there isn't any information. There will be information through the uh, partners. There are 1,500 new visit visitor information partners, including a number in in air itself um, and I would note that in the discussions that Visit Scotland had with South Ayrshire Council uh, just uh, uh, at the, uh, in, the, in the recent weeks and the meeting subsequent to the announcement uh, the three Ayrshire Councils did not have closure of the Visit Scotland site on the agenda as a council item uh, but clearly uh, we need to move into a digital age and it's very important that we encourage those and we now have two out of three visitors always using their uh, internet access to, to, to provide bookings and I think it's very important that we move into that digital age and encourage uh, businesses in air and the issuers to get involved with the Visit, uh, Visit Scotland Information Partnership 
programme, because that is, way, that is the way that tourism is moving. And indeed, the programme that's been set out by Visit Scotland has been supported by the Scottish Tourism Alliance. I just managed to squeeze you in, Mr Burnett. Uh, question nine. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I note my register of interest, particularly in relation to businesses in the tourism sector, uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the proposed tourism initiative, the North East 250. Uh, briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we welcome the industry-led initiatives such as North East uh, 250. Uh, of course, this is a privately uh, developed route uh, launched on the 8th of no November. It has the potential to encourage visitors to experience the wonderful scenery, the rich culture and the numer numerous attractions that the North East has to offer, from coastal vill villages in Banff and Buck and the distilleries of Speyside, Royal Deeside, to the vibrant city of Aberdeen. Alexander Burnett, and very briefly, please. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. I'm grateful to see his initiative come to the North East. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what data the Scottish Government will be looking to collect in order to determine the success of the project so that this initiative can be replicated elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this initiative hasn't come to the North East. It's been developed by private interests in the North East. And obviously, I'd encourage them to engage with everybody to, to see uh, the progress of that. But if it's anything like the North Coast 500, it's got great potential to maximise the economic impact. But it's very important that all of the North East can benefit. And I hope that that engagement and that inclusion will be part of the privately led initiative. Uh, that concludes questions on that particular portfolio. I apologise to Bruce Crawford for not reaching him. We'll try better next time, Mr Crawford. I move on to questions to justice and law officers. Question one, Anna Sarwar, please. To ask the Scottish Government how much the integration of British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland will cost. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government set out the projected costs of railway policing in the financial memorandum to the Railway Policing Scotland Act. Uh, the costs under current arrangements are around £20 million per annum, and the financial memorandum assumes an envelope that is the same in real terms following integration. At the cost of railway policing in Scotland, following integration will continue to be funded through contributions from the railway industry. Anna Sarwar. The, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Police Scotland submitted evidence to the Justice Subcommittee stating that they didn't know the cost of the merger. He will also be aware that not a single trade union or staff association representing the workforce supports the merger, uh, not the British Transport Police Federation, not the TSSA, the RMT or indeed the STUC. Uh, surely the Minister must now accept that this is a merger that the workers do not want and passengers don't need. Isn't it time that we ended this politically mer uh, motivated merger uh, right uh, now? Now, Luke, Mr Sarwa, supplementary, not a long ramble on to it. Um, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, please. Officer, the uh, Parliament considered these matters, including the Justice Committee, and voted on the bill, and the bill was supported by a majority of members in this Parliament. Then the Government are now taking that policy forward. A brief supplementary, supplementary, Liam Kerr, please. Officer. No details have been provided about which staff body will represent the employment interests of BTP officers north of the border after the force is abolished. Will the Cabinet Secretary end that uncertainty now? Cabinet Secretary. As a member will be aware, the uh, police say the Justice Committee have written to me on that matter looking for further details and will respond to the committee in due course. Question two, Linda Fabiani, please. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the mandatory imposition of non-harassment orders on people convicted of domestic abuse. Cabinet Secretary. The Domestic Abuse Bill, uh, currently before Parliament, strengthens the system of non-harassment orders by requiring a court in every domestic, ca domestic abuse case to consider, always consider whether to impose protection for the victim. Uh, this improves on the existing system, which requires an application to be made by the prosecutor. Where, consideration, where considered uh, con discretion uh, should remain, we consider that discretion should remain with the court in any given case. This is because there may be cases where such an order is not appropriate and the court needs discretion to ensure a decision can always be made on the basis of the facts and circumstances in a given case. Linda Fabiani. Uh, may I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary, as this bill moves forward, to give further consideration to this, and in particular the fundamental principle that the onus should not be on the victim to justify the need for a non-harassment order, but on the convicted perpetrator to justify why a non-harassment order should not apply. Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely. Also, we think that the requirement for the court to consider granting a non-harassment order in each case uh, and to give reasons for its decision will help to ensure that non-harassment orders 
are granted to protect victims where this is appropriate and necessary. Uh, however, we are always happy to engage with members to consider well there are further ways in which the uh, bill could be strengthened and I have uh, no doubt that the member will continue to make representations on these issues as she has uh, on behalf of her constituent over a period of time uh, now. But we do believe uh, that the system still requires uh, to have a level of discretion for the courts in deciding whether a non-harassment order should be applied. Three brief supplementaries in this. I'll take Claire Baker, followed by Lee MacArthur, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Claire Baker, please. Uh, thank you. I'm very supportive of domestic violence disclosure scheme known as Claire's Law, and, and it has recognised its value. But can I ask if the Cabinet Secretary has a view on a petition that was launched this week calling for a domestic abuser's official register? and similar to the Sex Offenders Register. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so no, sir, I am aware of the petition and will give consideration to the matters which are raised within it. We as a government are committed to taking forward a range of measures in order to tackle the issue of domestic violence uh, within our society. And there is still much more work which we have to take forward in addressing that. Then we will obviously give due consideration to the issues raised within the petition. Liam MacArthur, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I, and like Claire Baker, welcome the, the moves outlined by the Cabinet Secretary. What considerations have you been given to uh, extending the non-harassment orders uh, to cover children, particularly where those children are referred to as an aggravation in a particular case? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member will be aware that I'm due to appear at the Justice Committee uh, for stage two of consideration of this bill and have lodged an amendment in order to extend the provision of non-harassment orders to children in these circumstances, not to improve the protections which have been, uh, which they can be, can be made available to them, and that's in reflecting on the evidence which the Justice Committee received at stage one, particularly from children's organisations, about the impact that domestic violence can have on children. Uh, and I was uh, uh, pleased to see that the amendments which I lodged on Monday of this week were welcomed by uh, a number of the children's organisations who have been calling for an extension of the provision. Margaret Mitchell. Does the Minister agree that if the same Sheriff who heard the evidence in a domestic abuse case in the criminal court ruled in civil orders such as non-harassment orders following a domestic abuse conviction, then domestic abuse survivors would suffer less trauma? And if so, can he confirm that this one judge proposal will be included in the Family Justice Modernisation Study consultation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, my uh, colleague Annabelle Ewing has taken forward the consultation into a review of uh, family law and we will look at a range of measures. Uh, no doubt the particular issue which the member has raised is one of the factors which will be taken into account as part of any uh, consultation. If the member wishes to provide further information specifically on that particular proposal, I've got no doubt my colleague will be uh, more than happy to give it due consideration. Question three, Bill Bowman. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to tackle urban crime. Cabinet Secretary. My apologies, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government remains committed to tackling urban crime across Scotland. Overall, crime levels are at a 43-year low. Violent crime is down by almost half since 2006-07, and homicides are at their lowest since records began. The Scottish Government is committed to building safer communities by supporting local authorities, partner agencies such as Crime Stoppers, Neighbourhood Watch Scotland, the Violence Reduction Unit, the Scottish Business Resilience Centre and communities themselves in helping to create an environment where people feel safe and supported and where everyone takes responsibility for their own actions and how they affect others. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you for that answer and I welcome any reduction in crime but official figures for the past year show that Dundee is sadly one of the worst areas for violent crime, worst for sexual crime, plus attacks on NHS Tayside staff are up. What guarantee can you give Dundonians that these figures will be lower next year? Minister. Uh, well, I, I understand that there has been a, a spike in, in crimes of, uh, uh, of murder in Dundee uh, over the, the past uh, year. And I would say, of course, presiding officer, that we are committed to tackling all forms of violence uh, across Scotland, uh, wherever they manifest themselves. And we will continue to work with our national and local partners to make our communities safer uh, and stronger. And our strategy is focused on tough enforcement, but also coupled with education, early intervention and diversion activity, which is very uh, important. And hence our work, for example, uh, with the Violence Reduction Unit, which has secured Scottish Government support of some 8.7 million since 2008 and has developed key initiatives, which I'm sure uh, the member is aware of, such as the No Knives, Better Lives uh, campaign, the Medics Against Violence and the Important uh, Navigator uh, programme uh, itself. So we are absolutely committed to doing everything that we can to tackle violence across Scotland, including, of course, in Dundee. Question four, Murdo Fraser, please. 
um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of bail-related offences. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government is keen to discourage breaches of bail. That is why we have made it easier to bring charges for such breaches. Decisions in any given case uh, as to whether to grant bail is a matter for our independent courts. Murdo Fraser. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, his uh, response? But I am sure he is aware of a significant increase in the number of people breaching bail conditions. In uh, 2006 to 7, one in eight bail orders were breached. But figures for 2015-16 show that this is now one in five. In light of the, a recent high-profile sexual assault case no, please, a question where bail on the conditions were breached with tragic consequences, can the Minister confirm, is the Scottish Government considering additional measures to enforce bail conditions in order to protect the most vulnerable victims of crime? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, uh, we've taken forward two separate measures in recent years, in 2007, in order to tighten up bail-related um, uh, matters, and again in 2010, specifically through legislation. Uh, the most, uh, if there, there were 8,563 bail-related offences in 2015-16, very similar to previous years. Uh, between 2008-2009 and 2015-16, bail-related offences decreased by 6%. So there's been a reduction in the number of offences which are being committed on, uh, on, uh, on bail. However, that's why we also took forward additional measures through the Criminal Proceedings uh, Reform Scotland Act 2007 and also the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act in order to make it easier for our courts to deal with uh, breaches of bail but also to tighten up the conditions under which bail can be granted. However, uh, the member is incorrect in stating that bail overall breaches on, on bail are up. Um, where the statistics actually show between 2008, 2009 and 2005, 16, the most recent figures, bear-related offences have decreased by 6%. Question 5, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made with its commitment to modernise the prison estate. Cabinet Secretary. I recently announced plans for the modernisation of the women's estate on completion of these projects. Proposals for the next phase of the estate development programme will get underway. The next phase comprises of construction of HMP Highland to replace HMP Inverness, HMP Glasgow to replace HMP Berlinie, and also the proposed replacement of HMP Greenock. Finlay Carson, please. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Currently, there is no mention of HMP Dumfries within the strategic, uh, future strategic and corporate plan for the Scottish Prison Service. This is of obvious concern to staff who work at the facility. What reassurances can the Minister give the staff in Dumfries in regards to the long-term future of the prison? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, um, uh, HMP Dumfries is uh, an important part of the existing uh, range of provisions which we have within the Scottish uh, Prison Service. As I've set out, we already have a capital investment programme which is going forward in a number of phases. As a government, we've invested uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions in our overall prison estate in order to make sure it is fit for purpose, and we're continuing that programme over the coming years. As I said, we're already taking forward the next phase of the estates plan, and after we've completed that process, we'll then look at the remaining elements of the present estate, including uh, that of HMP Dumfries and also HMP, uh, HMP Open Estate uh, Castle Huntley. I should uh, also indicate to the member, given the capital cost which is involved in investing in our prison estate, uh, one of the major inhibitors to being able to invest in our prison estate has been a very significant cut which the UK government have been applying to our capital budgets. Mary Fee. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that I work closely with families outside and I'm keen to see progress made in improving the relationships that prisoners have with their children. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any plans to make improvements across the prison estate to the facilities that are available when children visit a parent? to make the visit less imposing and to help both parent and child maintain and develop close bonds. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we've been taking forward work with a number of third sector organisations to provide the uh, visitor centres within a number of our prison uh, establishments. I had the pleasure of opening the new visitor centre at, uh, at Glen Oco several months ago, which is a facility specifically designed in order to accommodate the needs of children uh, where they may be visiting establishments. We provided resources to allow that to be provided in some other prison establishments across uh, the rest of the uh, prison estate. We want to continue to build on that progress going forward because I do recognise 
that we know that uh, maintaining family lines and supporting family lines can be an important element to promoting desistance amongst offenders uh, and family centres within our prison system have an important role to play in helping to support and maintain those relationships. So the work that we have been taking forward, the additional resource we provided for some of these uh, facilities to be uh, established in a number of our uh, prison establishments is what we want to continue to see moving forward uh, in the months and years ahead. Question six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to ensure that it can continue to provide its existing level of service. Air Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government has provided the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service with a budget in 2017-18 of £316.4 <laughs> million, an increase of £21.7 million from the previous year. This budget has allowed the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to protect frontline services, notwithstanding significant cuts to Scotland's budget from Westminster. Of course, the funding for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service would go much further if the UK government would allow the service to recover VAT like other fire services across yeah, yeah. the UK, adding an estimated £10 million to yeah. their annual budget. The Scottish government will continue to press for a change to VAT legislation to remedy this long-running long inequity. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I agree with the Minister on the VAT issue. Given the uh, geographical spread of South Scotland region, any cuts will put communities at risk. And does the Minister agree with me that local community engagement is essential and that fire stations should be at the core of our communities and officers known in them, such as the recent bonfire awareness event at St Mary's Primary School in Lanark? So, can the Minister please give me assurances today that no fire stations will close or, or there'll be any reduction in services in South Scotland and indeed in Scotland more generally. Minister. Uh, well, I would like to also to, to pay tribute to the event that the member referred to at St Mary's Primary School in terms of bonfire awareness, a very uh, important uh, uh, kind of event and one that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service participate in day and daily across, uh, across the country. Uh, the member, I think, is alluding to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service's uh, transformation uh, 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 plans, uh, draft plans, which have been put on the intranet of the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service. Uh, and of course, uh, the transformation uh, proposals are, are out subject to discussion and no <coughs> final decisions have been made as to what transformation uh, will look like. And there is a commitment to engage fully with not just staff, but also uh, uh, the service as a whole and members of the public. But I would reiterate once again that being deprived of the sum of £10 million per annum from frontline services, frontline emergency services provided by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is certainly not a help presiding officer. And I do urge, I do urge the Chancellor to end this uh, iniquity to uh, place uh, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service on the same footing as every other fire yeah. service in the UK, which is not subject to VAT that is un, uh, unable to be reclaimed. And I do urge the Chancellor to take the opportunity of his autumn statement yeah. to do right by our frontline fire uh, fighters. Question seven, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what workforce planning and recruitment plans are in place for the police and fire and rescue services in remote and rural areas. Cabinet Secretary. Workforce planning and recruitment are rightly matters for the Chief Constable and the Chief Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to support our police and fire service. We are protecting the police resource budget in real terms in every year of this Parliament, a boost of £100 million by 2021. And we are providing additional uh, police reform funding of £61 million in 2017 18. We've also increased the overall operational budget for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service this year by £21.7 million to support investment in equipment and resources. Ms. Gail Ross. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. What support can the Scottish Government give remote and rural areas to roll out programmes such as the Uniform Services Programme at Galsby High School where recruitment to emergency services is an issue and will he come and pay them a visit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I do, much, I do very much welcome the initiative which has been taken forward at uh, Golfsby High School. I know that our uh, police and fire service uh, work very closely with a, a number of youth-based organisations in order to help to support and promote the work that our uni uniform emergency-based services carry out on a daily basis to protect our communities. Uh, and I'm uh, keen to make sure that we continue to develop that partnership between the police and also our uh, fire service and I'm uh, certainly more than happy to consider any invitation which I receive uh, in order to visit this particular initiative up at uh, Golfsby High School. 
A uh, brief supplementary, Maurice Corey, please. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Secretary Officer. According to figures collected by the Fire Brigades Union, the, the number of fire safety officers and inspectors has fallen from 102 in 2013 to 90 in 2017, a 12% drop in four years. Can the Cabinet Secretary give this chamber assurances that it plans to reverse this trend? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign Officer the way in which uh, the staffing complement is configured within the Scottish Fire Rescue Service is a matter for the Chief Officer. Thank you very much. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next. And can I apologise to Emma Harper and Donald Cameron, whose questions I did not reach this time. Thank you.